Hello, everyone. Uh, Manuel, Ines, myself, and Lillian are delighted to welcome all of you to this workshop on sex differences in circadian rhythms and sleep. Um, at our last count, I think we have over 300 attendees registered. We are thrilled about that to have people from all over the world. Of course, what this means is trying to coordinate time zones. And we do realize that some of you may not be able to attend all of the sessions or would only be able to attend partial sessions. But do not worry, we are recording these talks and they will be available for you all to listen at your convenience later. But this also means for the speakers to be just aware that we are recording your talks. Now, this being an online workshop, it comes with its own set of rules and regulations. And in the next two slides, I'm going to run through some of these. Of course, the topic of sex differences in research is complicated as it is contentious and controversial. And so there are a few things that I would ask all of you to just bear in mind. Our workshop is dedicated to providing a harassment-free experience for anyone, regardless of any differences that are listed over here. So please bear in mind that we are all here to learn and benefit from this experience. So just keep in mind that there should be no offensive verbal comments related to gender, gender identity, or any differences listed over here. Uh, the organizers may take an action, appropriate action, if they feel a participant is engaging in any harassing behavior. And if you're asked to stop, please do comply. Equally, if you feel you're being harassed or notice that someone else is being harassed or have any other concerns, do please contact a member of the organizing committee immediately. Um, a few other rules or do's and don'ts for the workshop. Some of these are similar to an on-site workshop, some a little different. Since this is an online workshop, please do keep your speakers on mute during all sessions. As with any other presentation in a workshop, we request that you hold off all your questions until the end of each presentation. And during the question time, please type in your question in the chat instead of asking it. This makes it much more efficient for the moderator to pass it on to the speaker. Um, and finally, at the end of each workshop, we have a polling form and do please fill it out because it will really help us to improve the series as we go along. Um, and with that kind of brings me to the end of the do's and don'ts of the workshop. And now I will move on to actually the theme of the workshop and talk a little bit about it in the various slides. So this is a workshop as we titled it on sex differences in sleep and circadian rhythms. And the first question is why do we even need to consider sex differences in research? And here I'm going to get a little anecdotal and draw upon my own experience. A few years ago, when I was doing research at the University of Surrey in Durkian's group, he came up and he said, let's look for sex differences in this large data set. And of course, my first thought was, I didn't say it, but oh no, not again. We have 16 women and 18 men in the group. I don't think we're gonna find anything. But a year later, I was a convert and completely changed my mind. And here are the two graphs that illustrate why I did so. Nonetheless, these graphs still present an incomplete picture of what sex differences are. And this is primarily because sex is a complicated construct to define and often it is confused with gender and sexuality, which people use interchangeably. And the next slide that I have over here, a picture from a Scientific American article, very nicely illustrates this complexity. Uh, but basically, I think in biomedical research, it is a consensus that one can think of sex as being defined by biological and physiological processes on a spectrum. It is important to remember sex is not dichotomous, but it lies on a spectrum. 
Gender is a self-identity that you can define largely based on psychological, social, and cultural factors. It also lies on a spectrum. And I think the key thing is it is not static, it can be fluid, and as we now know, can also change over the course of one's life. Likewise, sexuality is an orientation that lies on a spectrum defined sort of by your attraction to another person. It is also not necessarily static, it is fluid, and it can change over the course of your life. Um, given this complexity, it is hard to address everything in a single workshop. So as organizers, we decided to focus on a starting point with sex differences in sleep and circadian research. Um, and essentially, we came up with three themes for this workshop. We wanted to convey what is our current understanding of sex differences in the field? What do we know? What do we not know? And even more, what is it that we don't know that we don't know? if that makes a little bit of sense. Um, and in the first workshop, in the first series of this workshop, we have two speakers who will tell us what they know about sex differences in sleep and circadian research. Um, of course, it's also very important to consider the impact of understanding sex differences. And um, in the next series of the workshop, we have two speakers who will talk about sex bias that exists in the literature even today, and also how considering sex differences can actually change the course of disease treatment. And then finally, the biggest question is, how can we all implement change? And that's not necessarily easy. And in the final workshop, we have two speakers who will actually talk about how to implement change, starting with the basic preclinical pre research, all the way up to how we communicate research, for example, in journal articles. And really, at the end of this workshop, what we as organizers hope to achieve is very nicely summarized in this picture that I've taken out of an article in Nature. Um, we hope that all of you can get some understanding of the differences based on inclusion and diversity. And when you go out at the end of the workshop, actually think about how to implement this and affect change in your own labs, no matter the stage of career you are in, and really no matter what type of work environment you are in, whether you deal with policy and funding, or whether you deal with research, or even whether you're at the level of journal and communication. So with that, I think I will stop over here and now turn you over to the first speaker of this session. And I think Manuel is going to introduce the speaker. So thank you all very much for attending and hope you have a good time. Thank you, Tara, for the great introduction and also welcome to everyone from me. Um, Doro, do you wanna start sharing your screen while I... Let's do that. Perfect, great. So uh, Doro Fisher um, is joining us today. She'll be talking about sex specific differences in sleep regularity and also associations with health. Um, she's a trained psychologist, um, did her PhD in Till Renneberg's lab in Munich and then did uh, two postdocs at, ha at Harvard um, and joined the DLR in uh, Germany in 2019 where she works in Daniel Eschbach's group on sleep and human factors. Doro, uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction, Manuel. And um, first of all, I'd like to thank Manuel and Tara and Ines and Lillian uh, really for an outstanding job. I can, can only imagine how hard it must have been to move an on-site meeting to an online meeting under these circumstances, but I'm so glad you did. And so thank you very much for making this happen. Um, and of course, thank you as well for inviting me. I'm really excited to be a part of this workshop series. And today, I, um, I hope I can give you some new insights into a sleep dimension that is often overlooked. And that is not sleep duration or timing, but the regularity of sleep. So I will 
cover uh, some of the basics first. So what is sleep regularity? Um, why is it important and how can we measure it? And then I will move to some applications. Um, are there any sex differences in sleep regularity? Uh, what could be a link? And finally, I'll present two studies, one on uh, well-being and the second on hypertension. But I have to say the second study um, is from a prospective cohort uh, study, the Swenu ancillary study. And every abstract, every presentation has to go through a publications committee for approval. And unfortunately, I didn't get the approval in time for this talk. Um, everything just takes a little longer these days. Um, I think that's understandable, but still my sincerest apologies. And I will still tell you a little bit about what we did there, of course. Okay. So um, sleep regularity um, refers simply to the consistency in sleep between days. So this would be an example of a perfectly regular sleep wake pattern with identical sleep every day. But as we all know, sleep in real life can look quite different. So we usually observe that sleep on weekends is longer and later than during the work or during work days. Um, so real life patterns will always or usually have some extent of irregular sleep. And why is that important? Irregular sleep has been shown to have detrimental effects on health and safety. Um, most recent study that just came out this year uh, showed that regular sleep increases uh, the development, the risk to develop cardiovascular disease. So there was a prospective cohort analyzing new cases. We've also seen in recent studies that sleep regularity can outperform average sleep duration and timing as a predictor for health. And the assumed mechanism behind this is that day-to-day -day changes in sleep disrupt the circadian system um, because the circadian system is usually a bit more sluggish and takes some time to adjust to changes. And so irregular sleep can create a misalignment between the sleep-wake cycle and circadian physiology. But, and that really is one of the key points of today, if that's the case, we should be particularly interested in capturing a day-to-day -day variability and not just an overall or um, an average variability in sleep. And that brings me to the next point. How can we measure it? So most studies to date have used overall metrics. Um, these include, for example, standard deviation and a metric called interday stability. And these, um, so I won't go into much detail of these metrics, but the important point here is that overall metrics quantify sleep regularity relative to a mean. So they take each day and compare it to the overall, to the average sleep-wake pattern. In contrast, uh, new metrics have been proposed that compare each day to the next, right? Um, and so these new metrics include the composite phase deviation metric and the sleep regularity index. And so full disclosure here, the CPD metric was developed by myself in Till Runneberg's group and these SRI was developed by Andrew Phillips and Beth Klerman, who are both primary supervisors on this work. So we might be um, a little bit biased, but for good reasons, as I'll show you in a second. So these metrics, they can be classified according um, to how they calculate, how they quantify sleep regularity, but more importantly, according to the time scale on which they operate. So these overall metrics, they measure on a global and average time scale, whereas the new metrics, they measure on a circadian time scale. And I can illustrate how important that is with a simple example. So this is the sleep-wake pattern I've shown you before, and these are the values for each metric for this pattern. And so now we take each individual day, each sleep episode, and just randomly rearrange them, right? So we change the day-to-day -day sequence but without affecting the overall, the average sleep wake pattern. And in that case, standard deviation and IS, they still return identical values because average sleep onset, offset duration, that all is still the same. But CPD and SRI, they will return different values because they move from day to day and they capture these changes in the sequence of sleep. 
And if circadian disruption is the mechanism, then day-to-day -day changes are what we want to quantify. Um, all right, so with that, we've covered the basics. Um, let's now move on to potential sex differences in sleep regularity. And the question here is, are males more often irregular sleepers than females? And basically, two observations have led us to this assumption. The first is that males are on average later chronotypes than females. So chronotype describes how the circadian system embeds itself into the 24 hour day. So it, ver uh, it refers to a synchronization process um, and that produces what the popular media often refers to as larks and owls as morning and evening persons. I picked here uh, two large scale studies. Um, that show that on a population level, males are later chronotype than females, that's shown in blue here. But that's primarily the case uh, during the first half of life and might even change later in life. The second observation is that later chronotypes tend to be more irregular sleepers. Again, I picked two studies, one using the CPD metric, and it shows that later chronotypes have higher CPD values, so more irregular sleep. And another study used the SRI uh, and showed that the timing of dim light melatonin onset, so DILMO is, um, is a gold standard to assess circadian phase, so that DILMO has a later timing in irregular sleepers compared with regular ones. So far so good, but if we now look at the literature, we see very inconsistent results. So it seems as if you can take your pick. Out of eight studies that examined sex differences, three found no difference, three found females are more irregular than males, and two found that males are more irregular than females. So it's almost equally distributed. But these studies did not report on chronotype, and that's what we think might be, might be the link. So I went back to some of our own data sets. Uh, we have data from high school students, college students, day workers and shift workers, and I calculated uh, CPD to assess sleep regularity. And again, we find every constellation. But in our studies, we also determined chronotype. And when we look at those results, we see that the differences in chronotype pretty much exactly mirror those we see in sleep regularity. So for example, when females had a later chronotype, they also showed more irregular sleep than, than males and vice versa. So chronotype may explain some of these in, inconsistent associations and might be a link between irregular sleep and, and sex. Now we come to the first study uh, on irregular sleep and mental health that we conducted in 223 US college students, they were quite young, 37% female. We collected data uh, for approximately 30 days using actigraphy to assess sleep. So actigraphy um, is a standard way to measure sleep in the field. Participants wear these uh, acti watches around their wrist. They're basically research versions of Fitbits. And these devices record physical activity based on which we can then determine sleep onsets and offsets and uh, make a sleep wake classification. Um, students also reported their daily well-being upon awakening on five visual analog scales. Those were sleepy alert, sad happy, sluggish energetic, sick healthy and stressed calm. Sleep regularity was assessed using the CPD metric alongside sleep duration and timing. So one of our key results was that both sleep regularity and sleep duration were associated with well-being, but on different timescales. CPD predicted average well-being, whereas sleep duration predicted daily well-being. So for example, for the scale set happy, we found that students who were on average more irregular sleepers uh, felt overall less happy than their regular counterparts. So we see like a negative uh, relationship. Average sleep duration had no impact. In contrast, um, irregular sleep on a daily basis, so from one day to the next, had no impact on daily well-being, 
but sleep duration did. So if sleep during the previous night was short, then well-being upon awakening was also a bit lower. So there we find a positive relationship. Okay, so the second study uh, was then on irregular sleep and physical health. Here we analyzed data from the Suenio and Sillery study. That's a prospective um, cohort study. It's part of the parent Hispanic community health study. Both aim to examine cardiovascular disease and major risk factors among Hispanic Latino individuals living in the US. But Sueño specifically aims to assess the impact of poor sleep on these health issues. And it does so in a subgroup of approximately 2000 participants. So our goal in, uh, in Sueño was to quantify the, the relationship between irregular sleep and hypertension using the novel metric CPD and SRI. So when you have seven days of actigraphy data to estimate sleep regularity, hypertension is uh, defined according to certain criteria. And by now, um, data from the first follow-up visit are available. So we could not only conduct cross-sectional um, relationships, but also um, conduct prospective analyses. So we could analyze new cases of hypertension. And just like we did for college students, uh, we checked whether the results were modified by age, by sex, or by employment status. Unfortunately, um, as I pointed out in the beginning, uh, I can't show you numbers, but I can tell you that what we find um, in principle confirms an emerging consensus that sleep regularity plays an important role for both mental and physical health. And that indeed sex is an important variable that we must consider and it can modify the relationship between irregular sleep and health. So that leaves us with the question or the possibility that young males may be more vulnerable to adverse effects of irregular sleep. And I wanna point out that of the um, the eight studies I showed you in the beginning, only one also examined an effect modification by sex. Luckily, that was the only one in college students, so that makes comparison easier. And they too found that variability in sleep duration was significantly associated with weight gain in male students, but not in female students. So it's limited evidence, but it's pointing in the same direction. Overall, we definitely need more studies on, uh, on how sleep regularity differs between males and females, but perhaps even more importantly, we need more studies on how irregular sleep may affect males and females differently. Uh, and that uh, is also another open question. Why should irregular sleep have different effects on males and, and females to begin with? And the points I want to make here are by no means comprehensive. There's so many reasons uh, one can think of why males and females would be different. Um, but one important thing uh, we need to keep in mind is that sleep-wake patterns um, go hand in hand with other, many other rhythms and behaviors. And sex differences in one may reflect sex differences in another. So effects may not always be due to sleep, but to something that is in sync with sleep-wake behavior. The second point I want to make is uh, really close to my heart. It's, it comes from a methodological standpoint. Um, very different sleep-wake patterns can lead to identical values in sleep regularity metrics. And so to illustrate that, I, um, I have here two examples. Those are simulated sleep-wake patterns. On the left, we have a pattern where sleep just shifts from, done, from one day to the next, right? On the right, we have a fragmented sleep wake pattern where we see these nocturnal awakenings. So this could be insomnia-like behavior, for example. But both these patterns produce identical SRI scores. However, it's not difficult to imagine that the reasons for these two irregular patterns might be very different, which in turn may have different consequences for health, not because of the level of sleep regularity, but because of what's behind it. And that brings me to the last point. I think we need to keep in mind that the reasons for irregular sleep can be manifold. Mm, so irregular sleep may be a choice. It may reflect a lifestyle. 
Um, and support from this comes from a study and also quite young people. We've even seen an, uh, an association between the SRI and satisfaction with life. Um, so these irregular sleepers, they, they kind of loved it. They loved their irregular sleep wake behavior. And one could imagine that, you know, like a fun filled, rich social life may lead to irregular sleep, but that may not always be experienced as a bad thing. But of course, irregular sleep can be imposed, can be forced upon an individual by external factors, work schedules, but also social factors like small children, uh, pets caring for relatives. Um, however, we also know that irregular sleep can result from an interaction between extrinsic factors and intrinsic factors. So even under similar or, or same circumstances, two individuals can have different levels of sleep regularity. And so that suggests that um, it's really not only an individual and it's not only from the outside um, that, that leads to irregular sleep-wake pattern. So in summary, um, I think that perhaps males and females may not so much differ in the level of sleep regularity that they experience, but rather in, um, in the kind of sleep-wake pattern that leads to that level. And that in turn might lead to these different outcomes for health. So uh, with that, I, I'm gonna close. I'd like to thank all the people who were involved in this work, um, especially my primary supervisors, Andrew Phillips and Beth Clerman, also Celine Fetter, who's been instrumental in the shift work studies and the epidemiological analyses, as well as my current advisors at the German Aerospace Center, Daniel Eschbach and Eva Ermenhorst. Um, up here is my contact info if somebody uh, wants to reach out after the workshop. And um, thank you for having me and thanks for listening. Thank you, Dora, for this really, really nice uh, first talk in our workshop series. Um, we have a couple of questions that sort of came in already. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm just going to go through them as they came in. Um, to anyone whose questions I will not be able to ask, um, you know, feel free to email Doro uh, afterwards. Um, and Parisa, if you want to start setting up your screen share while we answer the questions, that would be good as well. So the first question is, um, a great talk regarding the association between sleep irregularity and mental health. Did you screen for mental disorders in your population? Uh, the direction of effect might also be from mental health problems to irregular sleep. Yeah. Um, so to the best of my knowledge, they did. So there was a collaboration between uh, Harvard University and MIT. And I think they only included students who were healthy. So who did not show any mental um, disorders at the time of the study. But we didn't follow up. So, yeah. Um, Great. Um, next question. This came from a couple of folks. Um, what is the minimum number of days of ictigraphy data required to apply the new metrics, specifically CPD? That is such a great question because we asked that ourselves <laughs> and we set out to do um, quite extensive simulation studies to uh, address that question. And unfortunately, <laughs> the answer is not straightforward. So it's not like I can tell it's, uh, we only need like five days. Because um, there is a trade-off between the number of days we have and the number of participants we have in, um, in the sample. So what I can say, uh, two days is not enough. And we always, uh, always recommend like at least five days. So if you have more, that's better, but more than four weeks doesn't seem to make a difference. So after that, it's just flat. Great. Um, one question, this is actually from a person who asked three questions. So I'm gonna go, go through them. Um, is female recruitment into these studies controlled for uh, menstrual cycle phase? So has menstrual cycle been controlled in these studies? I think is the question. Um, I don't think so because we had 30 to 35 days of recording. So we just have their cycle on record. Fair. Uh, and then I think this relates to an earlier question about inclusion. 
were uh, patients with very disrupted sleep patterns included or excluded from these studies? So is there a cutoff? Yeah, um, so we, so by patients, so we didn't have a clinical cohort, right? Um, so in like in our sort of real life um, populations of day workers or shift workers, we don't have a cutoff because that's our outcome often enough. And we wanna include even the extreme ends of irregular sleepers. Um, but for example, some studies uh, that used the SRI actually did a cutoff and only looked at the extremes. So they only looked at the 25% most regular and most irregular sleepers. Um, but we don't treat it as an exclusion criteria. Okay, there's just one clarification. So I, I might, must have misread this question. Parents, are parents with very disrupted sleep patterns included or oh, excluded parents. from the study? I, sorry, sorry I, I, I misspoke. <laughs> I misread this. Um, so I suppose that uh, refers to the high school student population. And no, we did not control for that. So that's a really good point. Because, um, yes, I agree. I could imagine that that sort of what parents the sleep-wake behavior of parents could somehow be reflected in their kids' sleep-wake behavior. Um, I'm not aware of any study who actually uh, examined that, how, you know, how strong the correlation is between parents and, and kids. Uh, we know that there's no strong correlation between the chronotypes of parents and kids. Um, so that might be one hint that it might be the same for irregular sleep, but I don't know. Great. And one, one last question, which actually, again, uh, is three questions masqueraded as one. Uh, CPD correlates with health, health measures, but the sex differences are noisy and the effects relatively small. Is social jet lag more, be, uh, more different between the sexes? Is CPD the best measure for circadian misalignment? And do, indivi do the individuals in your study with high CPD always have high social jet lag? Um, so they're definitely... Okay, I tried to remember all the questions. So there is definitely a correlation between social jet lag and CPD, but we see that for all sleep regularity metrics. Doesn't matter if we use IS or standard deviation or the SRI. So social jet lag has been used as a metric of sleep regularity because it sort of measures the weekly difference, right? So for, for those who, do, uh, who don't know social jet lag, it measures the difference in sleep timing between work days and days off. So it has a component of um, sleep regularity, but um, it only because it just measures between weekdays and weekends, social jet lag is uh, a metric for weekly variability and not for daily variability. So it's really a question of what we want to get at. So if we're interested in these day-to-day -day changes, then social jet lag is not a good metric. Then we should use something else like CPD or SRI. But of course, um, there's been a lot of studies showing strong effects for social jet lag. So I think we just need to keep in mind that these are different concepts and to think about what we want to measure and which outcomes might have stronger relationships with which concepts. Great, wonderful. Uh, thank you again, Dora, for the uh, wonderful talk and, and the questions. Um, if this was a, uh, an in-person uh, talk, I'd, I'd ask uh, you know the audience to clap again. Um, <laughs> thank you. So let's uh, move to the next speaker. Um, Tara, do you want to uh, take over again? Um, our next speaker is Parissa Vidafer, and she's going to be talking on the need for more studies on female circadian rhythms. Uh, Parissa did her PhD with Sean Kane and Claire Anderson in Monash. Um, and I actually first got to know Parissa through her paper on sex differences. Um, so it was a paper introduction. And she then has joined Helen Burgess for a postdoctoral position in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, and I'm going to turn you over now to Parissa. Great. Thank you so much for that introduction, Tara. And thank you to all of the organizers for both the invitation and for putting together this really important workshop, which I really wanted to kind of um, have had when I was doing my PhD, um, but I guess better late than never. Um, so basically my whole point today is to um, kind of shift gears from what um, Dorothy just mentioned with the sleep and shift your focus more to circadian rhythms. 
um, primarily the female circadian rhythms. Um, and my argument is that we need more studies looking at female circadian um, rhythms. Mm -hmm. And to kind of demonstrate this, um, let me just make sure. Great. So to demonstrate this, um, I'm going to talk about the prevalence of uh, women in shift work, um, along with the observed sex differences that have been reported from studies. Um, I'm going to, then going to highlight kind of the gap um, of, in our knowledge uh, of sex differences in the circadian system using a very basic PubMed search um, of studies that have been published in the last 10 years. Uh, and I'll elaborate as to why we've constricted it to the last 10 years. Um, and then I'm going to present some really cool findings from several studies that actually have looked at female circadian rhythms um, and how those findings can translate to the differences that we observed in shift work tolerance. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to end with some recommendations and some strategies for future research um, before opening up the floor to everybody else for the Q&A segment. Um, I should also point out that if it gets noisy, I may momentarily put myself on mute, but I'll be back on. Um, so essentially, we know that shift work is a very prevalent feature of our modern 24-hour society. Um, and we know about a third of the workforce in North America, uh, Europe, and also Australia engaged in shift work schedules. We also know that about 50% of these workers are females. So one of the kind of more well-established findings uh, of shift work in general, so irrespective of sex, is that when you are working uh, on night shifts or on a rotating uh, shift schedule, um, it poses a serious threat to um, the shift workers' physical, mental, and psychosocial health. And this is primarily due to the misalignment between the circadian system, uh, the workers' uh, schedule, and also the sleep wake disturbances. And so, if we've got about 50% of the population being women, uh, and we know the purpose of this workshop is to, you know, increase female enrollment, um, then we need to be kind of very careful how we're asking these questions and how we're trying to explain away these observed sex differences. Um, we know that there are sex differences in shift work tolerance um, from observational studies. So um, as an example, uh, we know that women on shift work schedules, for instance, report um, feeling more sleepy at work, uh, they have more sleep complaints and health complaints, they have higher absenteeism from work. And what you can see in this graph here is that women working shift work schedules specifically have more work-related accidents and injuries during the night, and you can see that here in the grey bar, uh, compared to men, despite having these near identical injury rates during the day. And so we're not entirely sure kind of what the underlying mechanism here is and in the literature there's tends to be more of um it's you know prevalence of studies that have looked at sex differences in the sleep wake homeostat um but fewer have specifically looked at um sex differences in the circadian system so these sort of observational findings of um sex differences in shift work tolerance um, suggests that it actually is a greater challenge for women than men. Um, but again, it's not without inconsistencies. So we know, for instance, that some studies uh, show no difference in the response um, to shift work between the sexes. And we know, um, and Tara you know, kind of alluded to some of these um, factors at the introduction of this talk, um, some of the factors that do contribute to these inconsistencies uh, in the literature include, but they're not uh, limited to, um, things like methodological differences between studies. Um, these studies are typically small sample sizes. Um, when women are enrolled in studies, a lot of the time menstrual phase isn't accounted for. 
Um, and we tend to have, um, you know, this uh, preference for kind of going back and forth between using the word sex and gender. So we've got to really kind of stop using sex and gender as two interchangeable um, terms, because there's, again, Tara has mentioned, they are very different. Um, and I'll touch on that uh, kind of towards the end when I'm providing some recommendations. Um, but to kind of highlight where we're at, we know there is this historic underrepresentation um, of including women in scientific research. Uh, and as a result, we've kind of left with these um, large holes in our understanding of how you know, the circadian system differs between men and women and how those differences translate to um, shift work tolerance. So if you have a look at this graph here, we can see that kind of between the 1960s up until about the 1990s is when the um, entry rates for uh, women in the US workforce started to increase. And the peaks um, happened somewhere kind of here in 1999. Now, at the same time that women were entering the workforce, um, you also had the efforts from uh, the advocacy groups, women's advocacy groups, um, you know, kind of pushing for the inclusion of women in scientific research. And this ultimately led to um, funding agencies like the National um, Institutes of Health to, you know, present a policy to include women as participants in research. But then in 1993, this policy was revised uh, because there was a general account office report um, that found that the NIH itself hadn't actually implemented this policy too well. So by 2015, um, the NIH had explicitly reinforced the need to include women in research. Um, and so what we were kind of interested in seeing is, okay, with these new mandates, um, how well are we doing as researchers in our um, efforts to enroll more women in studies and how many publications are there? So basically um, to assess how you know, the researchers in our field are doing in light of these mandates um, from the funding agencies. We carried out this basic PubMed search. So we started this by um, using the keyword human and circadian rhythms um, in the title and the abstract. And we found a total of 338 original articles published in English from 2010 until the present. Now, of these, about 5% also contained the keywords women or woman, 4% contained the keyword female, and only 1% contained the keyword sex differences, with less than 1% specifically looking at sex differences. Now, I appreciate the limitation of, you know, this basic search is that it doesn't necessarily um, account for all the studies where they have actually enrolled women, but they haven't mentioned that in the abstract. Um, but really the point here is to highlight that there is this disconnect between these mandates from, you know, the funding agencies to enroll more women um, in, in circadian rhythm studies for our purposes here, um, and the number of actual studies that have been published in this field to date. So we know that there are several factors that can contribute to this insufficiency. Um, we know the challenge of um, studying women uh, whose circadian rhythms fluctuate across the uh, menstrual cycle and um, also use of hormonal contraception has an effect on the system. Um, and while we acknowledge these challenges uh, exist when we study women, um, we got to really start kind of catching up and, you know, being able to recognize that these kind of limitations in our understanding are really great opportunities for further discovery. And there's a point I'm going to keep reiterating, so um, I hope you get used to it. But basically, um, what we uh, are trying to get at is the few studies that have actually 
delved deep and, and, and looked at the circadian system have found some pretty remarkable things. So, for example, Drs. Kane, uh, uh, Dr. Kane and uh, his colleagues and Dr. Bovan and her group um, have shown that core body temperature rhythms occur at an earlier time in women than men. Um, and this finding uh, stays even when the bed and wake times, so the clock times, um, are like, you know, consistent between the sexes. Um, we also know that Drs. Kane and Duffy um, had also found that the dim light melatonin onset, so that biological marker of the internal clock, um, occurs at an earlier time in women, um, and that they also have a shorter circadian period. So for the female shift worker, a greater decline of um, their alertness during the biological night, combined with the advanced circadian rhythms, could increase their susceptibility to accidents and injuries um, when they are working during the biological night relative to men. So these findings are quite crucial because they do, you know, allow us to kind of understand those observed sex differences um, in more detail. And that notion was confirmed relatively recently, pardon me, by Drs. Santhi and Bovan, um, where they conducted two controlled laboratory studies assessing sex differences in alertness. Um, and they actually found that women were more impaired than men at times corresponding to the biological night. Now, in addition to the findings of sex differences uh, in uh, the circadian variation of alertness, um, there's also evidence that sleep need, so that sleep pressure, accumulates at a faster rate in women than it does in men. So again, you know, translating that finding to um, the shift worker, it could also explain those reports from women uh, that they generally feel more sleepier on shift. And so one other thing um, that really needs to be taken into account is that we know that there are progesterone and estrogen receptors on the suprachiasmatic nucleus, so where the circadian clock is located. And so we've got um, some earlier work from Dr. Schechter that's actually shown how menstrual phase can um, affect the circadian variation of REM sleep in young healthy women. Um, and all of these women were actually free from hormonal contraception. So just kind of looking at how even within the woman, um, depending on kind of the fluctuation of the hormones, uh, the proportion of REM sleep alters. So I'm gonna present some data here. Um, I should disclose that the data that I'm presenting here comes from this incredible study that was led by Dr. Josh Gooley. Um, and I had the great fortune of analyzing this data set as part of my PhD work. So in this study, uh, there were a total of 124 healthy young participants. They were aged between 18 and 30. All of the women um, were naturally cycling, so they were free from hormonal contraception. And what we were able to do was determine um, how many were in the follicular phase and how many were in the luteal phase using objective and both, sorry, objective and subjective measurements. So our subjective measurements were self-reports and the objective measurements were um, the body temperature that was measured using uh, rectal thermistors. Um, so not a whole lot of fun for the participants, but it was great for us because what we were able to do was um, have a look at sex differences in alertness, but also take into account menstrual phase. So over here, you'll see kind of the protocol for the study. So um, of the 124 participants, 80 were men, 21 were women in the luteal phase, and 19 were women in the follicular phase. And so every individual had three baseline nights of eight hours of sleep um, before waking up to uh, this period of uh, 
sleep deprivation that lasted 30 hours. Um, and they, we use, sorry, they use a constant routine protocol. And uh, what we did during the time, so during kind of this continuous wake period, we measured our alertness using the psychomotor vigilance task, which uh, for those of you that aren't aware, it was just a basic reaction time task. Um, we administered it every two hours, uh, and that's how we assessed alertness. Um, and I'm just going to kind of walk you through what we found and how important menstrual phase really is when you're looking at sex differences. Um, so here you'll see that we've plotted the reaction times for women and men. Um, so the women are the open circles and the men are the closed circles. And so when you're looking at um, their performance overall, you can see that women have more lapses of attention than men. And this difference in reaction time is most pronounced during the biological night. So when we take menstrual phase into account though, we see that the initial sex difference that we observed here is predominantly driven by that poor performance of women in the follicular phase indicated here in red. And again, this difference is most apparent during the biological night, such that by 24 hours away, 60% of the responses of women in the follicular phase, uh, lapses of attention. You can see that there is a difference between women as well. So women in the luteal phase, indicated here in blue, they seem to be somewhat protected from this alertness failure. You can see that their performance is similar to men. So what we're illustrating here is that it's not just the case that all women are impaired than men when it comes to working the shifts, um, or in this case, reaction time you know, under sleep deprivation protocol. But it's just women during this one particular phase of their menstrual uh, cycle seem to be showing most vulnerabilities. We were also interested to see if there are any sex differences in these longer lapses of attention, um, and we determined this as a lapse or a reaction time, rather, um, lasting three seconds or greater. And so what you can see here is that if we only look at the sex differences, so again, the women are the open circles, the men are the closed circles, we can see that the responses are essentially overlapping. And this is still apparent even during a biological night. But when we go beyond just basic sex differences, and we take into account menstrual phase, we see a really different picture. The women in the follicular phase have more lapses of attention than women in the luteal phase and men. And we can see that women in the luteal phase, here in blue, are actually outperforming even the men. So they're outperforming the women in the luteal, uh, follicular phase, sorry, but also the men. So again, it's kind of you know, lending support to the idea that women in this luteal phase are more protected from those alertness failures. And what's important here is that when we don't take menstrual phase into account, you're not really seeing the full picture, right? Because what you're seeing here is when you lump women together, um, you're seeing the poor performance of the women in the follicular phase um, added to the better performance of the women in the luteal phase, and what that's doing is actually masking any differences that would exist. So overall, we found that sex differences um, observed in alertness are primarily driven um, by the poor performance of women in the follicular phase. Um, and these differences in alertness levels between the two groups of women could be due to kind of the thermoregulatory uh, properties of female sex hormones, which is seen in this graph. So we know, for instance, that progesterone um, has its highest concentration uh, in the luteal phase, and this hormone increases temperature levels, which 
in turn could increase the alertness levels. Um, and by contrast, in the follicular phase, there's a higher concentration of estrogen. Um, and we know estrogen lowers body temperature, which in turn lowers alertness levels. So it's kind of one theory. Um, we also kind of know from more um, recent studies that there is that association between, um, you know, the degradation of performance and the um, presence of female sex hormones. Um, and, you know, our findings really do have this kind of real world implication for the shift work in female, because, you know, those longer lapses of attention, if you were to drive, you know, 62 miles an hour, um, and you were to have one of these three second lapses of attention, it's equivalent to just kind of driving down the highway at that speed, you know, past about 18 cars without really responding to your environment. So for the female shift worker, um, their alertness levels on shift will be somewhat dependent on their cycle. So if you're, if you are that female going into your first night shift and you know, you're menstruating, um, you might want to take uh, added countermeasures to kind of mitigate those uh, alertness failures. So you might want to take that nap before you go into work. You might want to um, consume more caffeine. You might want to expose yourself to brighter light. Um, one thing that I'd really like to stress because it is a point that comes up every time I present this work, um, because as, as Tara mentioned, a lot of this stuff is kind of controversial, but we need it to not be controversial anymore. It's just a fact of life. Um, we never want the results of these studies um, to kind of be used as discriminatory tools. Um, so, you know, it, it's always kind of coming from a perspective of empowering the individual, letting them know kind of what's going on with their body, providing, you know, strategies for them to cope. Um, but it really shouldn't be the case where, you know, employers down the track ask women to, you know, um, inform them of when they're, you know, ovulating or when they're having their menstruation. Um, so, you know, kind of armed with this knowledge, we're really hoping that the female uh, worker can just, you know, be more proactive about their own health. Um, and yeah, it's never to discriminate. So some of the challenges that exist with studying women, um, like I said, they are understandable, um, but in an era of big data mining, where we're using artificial intelligence algorithms um, to inform uh, these personalized medical treatments, which is becoming more of a trend, um, they'll actually be really ineffective if the data that is being used uh, was predominantly done on men. So including women in research is just one crucial step towards our understanding of individual differences in circadian misalignment and sleep. Um, and, you know, a few kind of, uh, I like to think of simple steps, but, you know, a few of these um, challenges can be overcome um, based on some of these recommendations. So, for example, something to really pay attention to going forward is to really understand this difference between sex and gender. Um, so, you know, we know that sex is biological. It's something that's assigned at birth. Uh, it's fixed. Gender, by contrast, kind of is a spectrum. People's gender changes across their lifespan. Um, and they're really kind of more to do with, you know, social constraints um, and, you know, kind of the expectations that society has of the different um, identities. Um, and so kind of a good way of remembering is that gender is fluid, sex is fixed. And so you have to be asking like questions pertaining to each um, term. When we're designing our uh, research, we also need to consider that if women are going to be included, we have to, you know, get some more um, data from them just to again be able to account for what's going on within them and also between them. Um, and, you know, again, just kind of embracing those differences um, because we have seen you know, that with the handful of studies that I showed, there's some really compelling findings. Um, and, and they're really kind of fascinating. And I know from a personal perspective, I would not have been able to complete 
my PhD if it wasn't for the work of um, the early researchers that actually delve deep into this very challenging area. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot that remains to be discovered. So an important point, um, like I said, is to just kind of acknowledge that these challenges exist, have these kind of discussions that we're having now, and really kind of embrace these challenges as opportunities for further discovery. Um, and so we've got here, um, you know, maybe like a starting point for anyone interested in including women in their studies. I think these are kind of the basic um, bits of information to collect. And they're often, you know, cost effective as well. So for instance, um, if you're studying women, the first thing is gonna be, you know, are they premenopausal or postmenopausal? So that's a kind of good question to ask flat out. Oftentimes you can get that from age. So if you've got an age range of 18 to 30, it's pretty safe to say that all of the women in your study are gonna be premenopausal. Um, if you're looking at uh, an older demographic, um, you'd really wanna make sure that they are either postmenopausal, menopausal or perimenopausal. The kind of distinctions there are a little bit murky, um, but just kind of for uh, simplicity's sake, just got kind of premenopausal, postmenopausal, gives you an idea of their reproductive state, um, and then kind of the questions you want to be asking. So if you're premenopausal, we can tell just from three bits of information. So when the date of the last period was, how long that last period lasted for, and the average number of days um, in their typical cycle. From those, we can estimate um, kind of what menstrual phase the individual's at. We also want to know if they're using hormonal contraceptives, and if you want to be very thorough, please take note of the type of contraceptives that are being used as well. Um, and also with postmenopausal women, you again want to figure out kind of when did they stop um, menstruating, so when was the date of the last period. Um, any kind of reports of physical change, um, the severity of these physical changes, again, if they're using any kind of hormones, um, so if they're using hormone replacement therapy. And just as a general good rule, for both men and women, anyone in between, just ask, what is your sex at birth and what is your gender? Even if you're just describing your cohort, it really helps when, as researchers, we're trying to interpret um, the findings between studies and really try to understand what's going on. Um, so just one last point I'd like to add is that if you want to go beyond just your subjective reports, um, you can also verify those objective reports by using objective measures like saliva or collecting blood. I've personally done a lot of saliva samples in my studies. They're pretty cheap to do, um, aside from the assays, of course, but you can kind of throw that in. Um, but they're easy to collect, they're non-invasive. And when you plot out the individual profile um, of even just say, for instance, progesterone, you get a really good picture of where they are. Um, in terms of their menstrual cycle. So some pretty kind of quick ways um, and, and cheap ways to be more inclusive. Um, and before kind of opening it up to everybody for questions, uh, I just want to thank the organising committee for giving me this opportunity. Um, it's been amazing um, getting to know you guys and working with you. Um, I also want to thank uh, my mentors, so Helen, my postdoc mentor at the moment, um, and of course none of this would have been possible without uh, Sean Kane. Um, and just a special mention to Professor Steve Rockley and Associate Professor Josh Gooley. Um, Steve has been pivotal in uh, my um, development as a scientist, and uh, Associate Professor Josh Gooley just basically kind of created the blueprint for how to collect data. Um, and just also a special mention to my um, collaborators, Dr. Heidi Lamers van der Hoes and Professor Diane Bovan, um, who's really a pioneer in this field. So with that, um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'll open the floor to anyone else.
Thank you very much, Prosa, for a great talk. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to um, have you answer just one question. And apologies to the rest of you who also asked incredible questions. I'm sure you can interact with Parissa offline and email her for more detailed answers. So Parissa, the question for you is, have you looked at the effects in women taking hormonal contraceptives in your study where you distinguish between the follicular and luteal phases? So in the particular study that I just showed you, um, we, there were no women um, taking oral contraceptions or any form of hormonal contraception. Um, I think it would be interesting because I know the, um, that's a huge data set. So it would be really cool to go into um, the data set and have a look to see if there are differences, say for instance, between women in the luteal phase who are naturally cycling and women who are using progesterone um, only contraceptives and see if there's any difference there in performance. Um, but yeah, the short answer to your question is no, not yet. Okay, thank you very much, Parissa. And I will now turn the conference workshop over to Lillian for the next part. Yes, hi, thanks, Tara. Thank you to our speakers. That was fantastic. Um, so just so everyone knows how we're going to run. So originally we were going to have a five minute break at this point. So I understand that everyone's been sat down for an hour and I've been in many online conferences before and I think it's good to have a quick short break. So what I'll do is I'll share my screen and it's going to show you what the next part's going to essentially cover. So we will be using a program called Mentimeter to do some online sort of polling as well as the Q&A function um, to go through some questions and ideas, try and get some more information from you as participants. But what I'll do now is just say that we've got just two minutes. So if everyone wants to just do a quick stretch of their legs and then we'll just get into it quite quickly. So uh, it's 4.38 on mine, two minutes, and then we'll come back at 4.40 and we'll finish up the workshop like that. So I hope that's okay with everyone. Feel free to get a cup of tea or something if you need it lot of people back already just making sure that I've got access so I can see the chat bar as well as as many of your fantastic faces as possible um, so hopefully as many of you as possible are able to access menti.com using the code above here 929969 and hopefully it should be quite clear that there should be just a button for you to click to press like so we can see how many people are engaged and we can keep going through all the questions so i'll just give that a little bit longer so as many of you as possible can make sure that you are logged on and um, so what my role is so i work for um welcome trust and i run an organization called edis which stands for equality diversity and inclusion in science and health it's a coalition of organizations in the field who all believe edi is incredibly important to the field and also that there's a lot of work to be done um, this year we've been focusing on two areas which is kind of why i've been brought into this workshop one is around um it's been around inclusive conferences and events as we understand they're quite a pinnacle moment in a lot of people's careers and then the second one thinking about research itself and thinking about inclusive research design and practice so for that sex differences for example and sex and gender differences are both de definitely a part of that um, but we also want to think a little bit broader as well so hopefully i'll go over a couple of those bits as well um, but realistically the part of this workshop is to not only understand who's here in the workshop so we can make sure that we tailor the next two sessions nicely but also we're going to collect a little bit of information and data from you and um, ideas and as thoughts are based on the talks that have happened so far which we might then use in some of the write-up work as well and finally i think which will hopefully come out through the next two workshops more, will be try, trying to create these sort of action plans, sort of ways forward that we can start acting as a collective to make a difference in this field. So whether that's thinking about your role, if you're in publishing or if you're in funding or an active researcher and thinking about what are the next steps. So I thought that last slide from Parisa was particularly great about what data can be collected when we go forward as well and things like that. So hopefully that's useful and hopefully it won't be, take too much time at the end of each session, but it will be something that we can all go away with something with. Um, in addition, we'll try and share as much of this information in between workshops and after work, or the, work, the three sessions as well. So all of this will be available for everyone to use going forward. Um, so I so see we've got quite a de decent number of people here and that's great. Um, so the idea was known unknowns and unknown unknowns. So as Tara mentioned before, what do we know that we don't know and what do we know 
what do we not know that we don't know? Um, so the first question I just wanted to check with everyone here was asking you um, to think about the, your work currently and understand what what everyone's roles are within the workshop and this will really help us for the next two sessions particularly so you know are you primarily a researcher do you work in policy are you more involved in funding decision making publishing healthcare clinical practitioners for example and if you do feel like you're not represented particularly well here with this these questions you there is a Q&A function that you can then um put at the bottom where it says ask a question we can bring that up as well and we can have a look at what other options sort of fill under those and make sure that we are really trying to represent the field as best as possible when we're thinking about how to move forward so as expected i did think this was going to happen we're going to have an incredibly large amount of researchers here because the way this program was tailored and that's great it means you know we can make things quite clear as we go through as to what actions and activities people can take part in um, so I believe 70, I think 80 or so was the first page likes or something like that. So I think each time we hit roughly 80, I'm more than happy to sort of start moving along, I think, from the questions, I think. So there's a couple couple more people coming in sort of slightly later, but that's, I think, great. Um, okay, so that's great to know that we've got a lot of researchers here, a lot of active researchers. Um, also really interesting to see there are still people from policy and publishing we lacking funders and i think that's it's something that we noted when we were bringing out the invitations for this was how do we then bring some of this information to funders so i guess what we're creating here is a collective of researchers and others that would then maybe ask for the funders to change policies as well so i think that's really useful information um the next question that I wanted to ask then was thinking about, and this is really great that everyone's a researcher almost, thinking about the research questions that you're asking currently. Have you already looked at sex and gender disaggregated data? And it's completely fine if the answer is no, it's completely fine if the answer is yes. This is just trying to get an understanding of the field and where everyone here is at right now. I can imagine this might be slightly skewed because of the topic of this uh, presentation of this workshop series, but understanding our base for where we're starting, I think is incredibly important. Okay, it's really interesting to see it as it comes through live and seeing how many people went you no know, first and then it came back up to yeses. Um, the other thing I just wanted to also mention is that I still have the chat bar up for Zoom. So if there's additional comments and questions that you want to put in there at any point, I can still see that. So hopefully we can bounce back between all of the different options of the many virtual ways of communicating via online platforms. Okay, so we now have 92 people answering this question, 93. So that's great. So I think I'm going to start moving on once we hit sort of around the 90 mark as well for these questions. Um, so this is really interesting. So we're actually, so 54.30, so my math is awful at the moment because I've actually been out of research for far too long. Um, but we're looking at close to a third to two thirds, I guess, in that respect, um, which is actually a lot higher than other fields, especially other fields I've spoken to. Um, one of the things I think is really interesting is if you were to go on, there's a, a site out of Stanford called Gendered Innovations, and I'll share that website as well. They also talk about sex and gender disaggregated data across different fields outside of biomedical and health research and thinking about physics as well. And there's lots of other elements like mathematics and AI. Um, needless to say, biomedical and health research still has a high proportion of people looking into this already. But I think it's really important to understand that this could actually expand beyond the biomedical and health research field. So as much as this is the first step, because it feels more obvious, there will be other elements of research that also need to start considering this. Um, so the next question that is actually going to be hopefully really useful for us as organisers is to now think about whether or not sex or gender could be a variable. So I assume that if you answered yes in the last question, you're probably going to answer yes here as well. But realistically, what we're really interested in is those group in the know, could it be a variable that might have an impact in some way, shape or form? Um, whether that's your research that you're currently doing or the research fields that you're working in specifically. One of the things I will say is when you're thinking about if the answer is no, is that because someone's already done that piece of research and shown that it's not a difference? Or is it, for example, that you're only looking at one sex? Because if it's only looking at one sex specifically already, you're probably more likely to go into the NA field. Whereas if you are thinking, this is something that I don't think, or it doesn't seem like it would, or something like that, we really want to try and create that research and evidence base where we fundamentally do know yes or no whether this is a difference. We don't want to get too far down the line where it's start using this research within policy itself and then realize that we need to backtrack because we never actually checked for this firmly in the first place. 
So this is really interesting and I'm really glad that this has come out kind of how I was hoping it. So that's always great to know. But the idea that actually, yes, this could fundamentally be a difference in most research that's being done currently. Um, so oh, an option for clinician scientists and future surveys is a great shout from Nina. Yes, I'll make sure I try and improve that. Um, and it's really great to have feedback like this for as we go through this. The other thing I will note is that this workshop that we're running is obviously working in um, circadian rhythms and sleep at the moment. But the idea is that we could take this platform, this style, and take it to other fields as well to also spread this message across from different um, fields of biomedical science too. Um, so we've got 100 people participating in these surveys now. So I'll try and link it to those numbers as we go through. Um, so the next question, although this is a workshop series that's really thinking about sex as a difference, there has been a lot of mentions of other elements of difference that could also have an impact on research as well, specifically in this field, but also in wider fields. Now, the first question, and I will let you know what the second question is as well. So the first question is understanding what elements of difference could impact research outcomes that you can look at. So these are things that you might be able to collect data on. And this will come up as a word cloud. So if stuff gets repeated, the words will get bigger um, and try and keep things sort of one or two words as we go through. The other thing to mention as well is that the next question will be things thinking about things that you don't feel like you can measure. So if you can think of a difference here, but you don't think that you, you can actually ask that question or measure it, or there's too many categories or you know it's too much, we'll have a second question to try and collect some of that as well. So this is really interesting as it comes through. There's lots of things coming through personality, mental health, menstrual cycle. I think those were really key ones that came through earlier. Um, so you can keep repeating and keep resubmitting um, words as well so there's a space for three but you can actually keep going through more and these what we'll do is we'll then also take this and make sure we share this with everyone as well so that you have an understanding of the different types of differences that we're speaking about the other thing that we want to do with this is once we've got all of this information through is we're going to try and figure out how many of these feel like they're set, settled more in biological basis uh, bases and how many of them feel like they're more in social cultural factors and really try and get that an understanding now some of that could end up being on a bit of a scale on a bit of an index we'll figure it out once we've kind of looked at all them as a whole but the idea is that some of these I think there was a piece of research that I spoke about earlier about how there was sort of some elements of uh, sex differences in chronotypes. However, the reaction uh, and the, the inf influence on that was different between men and women. But that second element, you know, the idea of how, uh, how much you respond to these differences could be more gendered and could be more of a social cultural side of things. So really trying to understand and unpick those differences as we go through. There are lots of amazing, amazing points on this slide. And I'm very excited to see that people are submitting more than one as well as we're going through into a lot higher, higher numbers on this one. And this will be incredibly useful information, I think, going forward as we go through these workshops as well. And we'll base some of our future questions around some of these um, ideas that you've put through here. So what I might do is I might now pause this question on here. So I'll just give another sort of 30 seconds or so um, before we go to the next question. And the next question is very much going to be thinking about what are the different elements of difference that you don't feel like you can measure or that you don't feel like you can collect but could still have an impact. One thing that I really wanted to just uh, factor in, I think this was mentioned slightly earlier, was that we are talking about differences between people and the differences between groups of people. And we have to be very, very aware of ourselves when we're doing this, that our research and the way that we speak cannot then be taken on as reasons for discrimination or reasons to treat people differently. What we're understanding here is that there are differences that fundamentally change the way that people behave or act or react or develop or grow. However, what we're not saying is therefore treat them differently. What we're saying is therefore treat them equitably. Think of ways to bring them up rather than ways to cut them out of conversations and situations. And I think that's really crucial as we go through this. Um, so I'm gonna pause this slide now and we're gonna go on to the next slide. I'm sorry to everyone who might have a lot more things to say, but I think there's only so many pieces of information we can bring onto one. Um, so the second one is another word cloud. So it's gonna be the same sort of format. And now it's thinking about elements of difference when we are working with people, specifically people probably, that might impact your research outcomes. 
that you don't feel like you can actually look at or that you can't measure or that you can't come up with a way of doing this. And this is really thinking about what are those ideas that you've kind of thought about in your head that just feel like they're too out of reach. And it could be that other people are able to look at these and they might have done this in other studies, but you personally have found them difficult or have found barriers or there isn't enough understanding behind some of these yet because i think it will be really good to compare this with the other slide and try and understand what sort of blockers and barriers there are to researchers to include differences within their research here as well so i think there's some really good ones here around family history yeah there's certain elements that become incredibly complex and built up over generations that together that information would be near impossible and then to use that in an anal analysis of your research would be a whole nother field as well um behavioral choices as well a really broad brush on behavioral choices i think is an excellent one there was some talk earlier around whether or not people were choosing to have different um social and nightlife type personality traits and how that influenced their sleep and things like that again how do you how do you really factor that in and measure that that that, that desire to have those different sleep patterns for example um some really interesting ones as well around mental health as well and some specifics behind that i think those are really important and something that could be either difficult or complex when you then factor it in and the thing is a lot of these elements we know are difficult and we know are tricky to factor in but we don't want to exclude people as a result of having these differences because we know that then down the line somewhere those people who have been excluded from fundamental research get excluded from the implications of that research and whether that's health interventions or policy changes those people are the ones who have not been able to benefit from the research going forward and then when we think about inequality in general what you'll find a lot of the time is that will then exacerbate exacerbate uh, inequalities that we find in a basic social cultural context and they get brought through into healthcare and health interventions as well okay this is fantastic and there's lots of incredible stuff here and i think this is really important to include within this piece of work that we're doing um what we'll do is we'll think about some of these next week as well when we're, we're going to talk about the barriers felt by individuals to be involved in research as well as the barriers felt by researchers to involve individuals in research so this is a really great fundamental piece for that so i'll go on to the next slide um i'll just give it another 30 seconds or so because i can see there's a couple more things trickling in um there's there's some really interesting ones here that also are replicated in the previous slide as well so it'd be great when we go through next week to sort of discuss some of those um overlaps as well um and also the other thing i wanted to know is that if there's any researchers out there that see one of these and go actually we figured out how to measure that how to create an index for it or something like that feel free to put that in the chat bar because i'm sure you'll be helping someone else out in this conversation as well Okay, so I'll go to the next slide. I know that we've only got about five minutes left before I said that I could let you all go. And this is a very much a free for all now. It's thinking about research questions involving difference that you think need to be answered and they need to be answered either before you get on with the next bit of your research or before other people in the field start with theirs. And you can be very vague if you would like to. I know some people like to keep research questions to their chest, but I think thinking about the idea of what what differences do you really have this idea now from the research that's been done or from anything that you've read where you go actually that looks like it's going to make a difference and that looks like it needs to be looked at and also i think when you think about how research gets used later on when we think about how it then gets used in policies how it gets used in healthcare recommendations things like that if you think those few steps ahead and you think maybe some people are already starting to use that have we actually done the work that needs to be done beforehand um, so sex differences present in infancy how they impact the development of the circadian rhythms yeah i think that's incredibly important at what point is this set so therefore at what point do we need to make sure that we are including sex differences in our studies i think that's also incredibly important i'll give a little bit of time for this one because i know this could, this is a bit more of a free thinking one but i think it's really important to go through associations between sleep duration quality and cardiometabolic consequences in different men and women yes taking those sex differences or gender differences as well and bringing them through into other aspects social status and consequences of we're growing up late chronotype and irregular sleep yeah i think that one got mentioned earlier on that this is something that seems to be a link that needs to be developed more changes over the lifetime in women versus men which are important and which are not yeah How do different types of hormone-based contraception affect or 
unfortunately, I think this is going to. I wonder if it's going to cut out anything else that comes up if there's too many points on this one. They will all come through, and I wonder if I can actually. Mm, yeah, there we are. I can scroll. Um, environmental pollutants affecting circadian rhythms differently in men and women. I think that's a really interesting one as well when you think about environmental pollutants, for example, because there will be so many social factors and ge geography factors that then influence environmental pollutants as well. So thinking about we're taking that basic research and we're understanding then how that influences people in their homes and where they live. Um, I am very aware that we're about a minute away from our time and I promised the rest of the organising committee that we would try our best to finish on time. And I know that people might have meetings after this. So I am going to continue to scroll this slowly, but just wanted to also close off and, and go on to the next slide. The next slide is important for us, which unfortunately I know lots of people don't like this, but it is a, a feedback slide, of course. So I'm going to place that up so that people can go through that. And um, we'll do this exact same slide after each of the presentations. And you just basically for the five comments, do you strongly disagree through to strongly agree? Um, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to be offended if I suddenly see everything as disagreeing right now, even though it's coming through live. Um, but I wanted to really say thank you, everyone, for participating today. I think there's a whole depth of incredible information that we've managed to get out of this group in about 20 minutes, which I think is incredible. And like I said, we'll be sharing that. We'll be sharing the slides. This presentation has been recorded. Um, we will make sure that, that all of this information gets sent back out to everyone. I also wanted to note in the chat bar as well, there are a couple of really useful links, including the Canadian Institute for Health Researchers um, online training modules on sex and gender in research, which I think is a really useful resource to send out. So we we'll definitely make sure that link gets shared around as well, um, as well as anything else that Scott mentioned as well. To all of our speakers, your talks were incredible and there are loads of additional questions in the chat bar. So before you go, have a quick look and just see what's on there as well. Um, hopefully everyone should have all of the information about people who are presenting. So if there's other things you wanted to get in, in touch with and um, you can let us know about that. Um, so I think on that, I will leave this slide going for a while. But for anyone who's answered it and anyone who's happy with the rest of the presentation, how it's gone, please feel free to leave and drop out of the call at any time. And hopefully we'll see as many of you as possible next week um, at the same time where we'll be thinking about the uh, impact of differences within research. Thank you.